Hello, and welcome to the webinar. This is Dr. David Nace, Chief Medical Officer here at Innovacer, and I'm thrilled to have you all join us and talk about fulfilling the promise of data, how activating data with AI and cloud-based technologies will really help move us into the future in healthcare. With that said, I'd like to introduce my guest, Dr. Shev Partovi. Dr. Partovi is the worldwide lead for healthcare life science and genomics at Amazon Web Service. Shez, welcome. It's great to have you here. Thanks so much. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Thanks, David. It's, it's great to, to join you today. Awesome. With that said, let's get started. Great. So we all know that healthcare has really not progressed a lot. You know, we're running a little bit behind. <laughs> And so um, the rest of the world has digitalized. We all have our smartphones, and yet things just don't seem to be moving in the right direction in healthcare. So we've all been patients. We've all worked with family members that are patients. And it's really frustrating. And it's all disconnected. The data sits in silos with org different organizations, different institutions, different people. You might have a doctor, there might be a social worker involved, a care manager, we're getting stuff done at labs, we're getting done stuff at hospitals, our health plan plays a role in coverage. Dr. Pardovi, isn't this a problem in our industry? Yeah, absolutely. Well, when you look at um, the typical uh, sort of experience in healthcare, the ecosystem is completely siloed and patients are left to sort of wander and, and break their way, make their way through this. It's, it's incredibly challenging. And today, the way the consumer feels is their sort of best experience anywhere is what they expect everywhere. And so when you look at it from that lens, we have great experiences in many areas. And um, when we get to healthcare, where it's so personal and so important, regrettably, it's uh, fractionated, broken, and it's perhaps uh, among the least uh, friendly experiences we have. So incredibly disconnected. And of course, at AWS, we're doing all that we can to help uh, support our customers and our partners in stitching together this ecosystem to sort of create that holistic and seamless and frictionless experience. We talk a lot about how do we remove friction for patients and providers and clinicians as they sort of traverse their journey. So I totally agree. This is an area of huge opportunity uh, for the entire ecosystem to um, do right by patients. That makes a lot of sense. So we all know that we talk about data being the new oil, right? You know, data is going to help drive our future. We see that with our smartphones. We see it when we use Amazon to go shopping. We see it when we use Google to search. So, you know, what are the kind of things that our data should tell us? You know, the, the story here is actually uh, interesting because we've spent, uh, as, as, a, as a nation, really, with, the, with uh, electronic health records, we've spent a lot of time digitizing data. And, and by we, I mean, uh, of course, patients themselves as well as clinicians. And the real sad truth is that this data is not moving uh, from data to information, sort of from information to knowledge, from knowledge to prediction and insights. We have all these data silos, and the real value of that data is, is lying locked. And if we are able to actually liquidate those silos and, and bring that data together, um, the opportunity to apply uh, machine learning, AI, ML, and to build predictive models that don't just tell us what has happened, as you pointed out, but rather looking into the future, the probability of what is likely to happen. Because really the only reliable way to change the cost quality curve is to predict things and then to intervene early, to predict an asthma attack and intervene early, to predict congestive heart failure and intervene early, not simply to treat the acute condition after it's happened. So all the work we've done nationally and, and quite frankly, globally on digitizing data, it, it's, it's the shame of it if it just sits there in those silos. And I think the opportunity with AWS and with the machine learning technology we have is to help our partners and customers uh, to do right by patients by and right by clinicians, by taking this to the next step of data to information, to knowledge, to wisdom, to insights, to prediction. And then of course, as you pointed out here on the slide, ultimately to action. No, that makes a lot of sense. And you know, here at Innovaster, and we, we really enjoyed our partnership working with AWS. It's all about what is the next thing I need to do? What is the action I need to take? That's what people want to know. That's what the doctor wants to know, the care manager, the patient. So we hear a lot about these terms, right? artificial intelligence, machine learning, deep learning. It's very confusing to a lot of people. Can you quickly just sort of make sense of what these terms mean? 
you know, the, the way that maybe the, meta, the parallel I can draw is that how you and I function is that we have sort of information come to us, data. Let's say you look at a picture of, a, of an item with two wheels on it, and based on your upbringing, you look at that data and decide that's a bicycle, and you made a decision. And then with machine learning, it's sort of the other way around, where you show data to a machine and you tell it the answer. So you show pictures of a bicycle, of, of some a bicycle, and say that's a bicycle. You show a picture of a tricycle, say that's a tricycle. Picture of a unicycle, say that's the that's a unicycle. And by showing enough pictures or data and and telling it what it is, giving the answers, the machine actually builds a model to be able to understand that on its own. It doesn't create a rule. It doesn't say if one wheel, unicycle. And, and that's the thing, it actually creates that machine learning, it's its own rule, its own model. And based on that idea of you give machines ground truth data and you tell it what it is, the model that can then be used to make predictions. So as an example, if I show data of patients with congestive heart failure to a machine and say of these patients, which we did with turning together about 210,000 uh, patients under sort of de-identified de data under IRB review and actually told the machine these are the patients with congestive heart failure and it built a model with 91.5 percent and then we brought 3,000 patients test patients the model had never seen before and it could predict congestive heart failure 15 months in advance of it actually occurring so the idea of taking data that you already have telling the machine the answers, the machine builds a model, then you use that model elsewhere to make predictions on data it's never seen before. That's sort of the heart of uh, the power of machine learning is you train it with what you've known and then you use that to make prediction on new data it's never seen. No, that makes a lot of sense. And we're gonna kind of get into this with some case studies in a bit. You know, one of the things that we, um, that we all don't often pay attention to is there's artificial intelligence leveraging data in our lives today, right? In the flights that we take, I'm actually taking a flight later today and I just got a note that my flight's delayed 20 minutes. Very useful information. You know, Netflix, it tees up the movies that we want to watch based on our preferences, self-driving cars, you know, Tesla, people are getting a lot of attention, smartphones. So this is happening in other parts of our health system. I mean, in other parts of our lives, but not necessarily in our healthcare system. So. What's been the barrier? Why haven't we seen this adoption in healthcare? Um, you know, going back to that sort of basic premise of building uh, models that you can use, uh, data is uh, sort of the, 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 the heart of the matter. We talk about the three Vs, so the volume of data you need, the variety of data you need, the veracity of data, so the truth of data. And one of the greatest challenges is sort of the, the paucity of broad scale data to build these models. When you think of how many people are using uh, to watching Netflix and rating movies? There is a depth of data there that helps build those models, or or in, or in consumer retail online and the data there, the data wrangling and getting data to be ready for building models of prediction, is one of the greatest challenges we're facing today. Uh, it's not the only one, but certainly is one of the greatest ones. And so that paucity and that uh, need for data wrangling is is a headwind to really building these models out and using it at wide scale. No, that makes a lot of sense. And, you know, as this slide shows currently from this study that Accenture did, um, you know, people don't know if they've had experience with AI. And 65% of people said they haven't had any experience at all. So, again, we see it in our daily lives. It's in everything we touch. People aren't sure if they're experiencing yet. But there are some headways. And I know that AWS has made some great moves and certainly here at Innovator, in our partnership, we've used AI in many things that we do, including machine learning. So with that said, um, let's go ahead and ask our audience some questions about what they've been experiencing, right? In terms of implementing AI technology today, are you doing that in your organization? So please use the toolbar, select your choices. Is your organization going through AI-related implementations now? Are you ready for AI? and you got an implementation plan, do you want to use AI, are you not ready? Let's give the audience a little bit to do that, but you know, Dr. Pardovi, there is AI going on in some organizations in healthcare today. What are the major areas we're seeing this beginning to be adopted? You know, you, you can, what we're seeing um, is sort of falls into three categories uh, for artificial intelligence, machine learning. The one category is around what, what I would call operational forecasting. 
And that's where you're using machine learning and AI to predict operational things such as um, what are the uh, problems that patients will not show up for an appointment that they've made in a clinic. And, and these operational forecasting uh, solutions, uh, technologies help really run the business better. They help take out cost and really essentially fine tune um, the operations in healthcare. So that's sort of category one, operational forecasting. Um, we also see a lot of um, activity in our customers and our partners with respect to predicting patient health events. I gave an example earlier of predicting congestive heart failure, and these are machine learning models that are built and used in almost a way you can think of them as clinic, uh, as augmented clinical decision, decision support. This the idea here is that there's a there's a a, 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 um, a predictive input that is supports the clinician in making their own decision. And so you're surfacing a prediction, but you're st still surfacing it for the clinician. And they look at that data input as an input just like a lab test. And so that's what I, number two is predicting health events. And the, the third category of things that we're seeing is where it's the more the more typical one you hear in, in the media, which is the AI making a diagnosis. Um, for example, um, GE recently received its um, federal uh, FDA clearance um, on a model that was built on AWS for diagnosing pneumothorax, a, a chest puncture. And so when a chest X-ray is taken, uh, the, um, the actual embedded intelligence in the actual X-ray machine, immediately upon snapping the picture of the patient's chest, uh, for example, an intensive care unit will determine if the lung has been punctured, if there's a pneumothorax, and if so, will then alert for rapid response because, of course, that can be a medical emergency and life threatening. So, those three categories of operational forecasting, uh, predicting patient health events in, in terms of de supporting decision making, and then actually making clinical diagnoses are the three areas where we see our customers using AWS um, to sort of trailblaze in those areas. Well, this is fascinating because the idea of creating efficiencies, oh, here, look, we have results. So let's take a look at this and then we'll chat a little bit more about it. So, wow, this is really interesting. 35% of these organizations of our attendees are going through AI related implementations today. Well, this is surprising. What do you think, Chess? I, I, I'm I'm excited. I'm thrilled, actually, and uh, and it may be that uh, there's a bit of bias. We probably attracted people that are interested. <laughs> <That's right. laughs> What's really cool is that like half, you know, a third of the people are going through implementations, but another third want to do it, but they don't know how to get started. What advice can you give them about that? You know, the the trick to doing, at least uh, in my opinion, there are things. Um, that you don't want to do and there are things you want to do. What I mean is that AI doing machine learning, there is a set of um, undifferentiated heavy lifting that might be needed that you would rely on a partner like AWS to do for you. And then there is, there are things that actually advance your own, um, your own um, sort of differentiation in the market. Our view of this is what we want to do for those 32% of you that would like to do AI is that we would like to do the undifferentiated heavy lifting. There are things, you know, sort of the the, the hard part of the infrastructure and, and how to actually put together the, the, the technology needed to do machine learning mo and, and train the models and then to deploy them. There's a set of things that are the same, whether you're uh, in media entertainment, whether you're in oil and gas, or whether you're in healthcare. That undifferentiated heavy lifting, we find that um, sometimes customers get pulled into it. And, and that's the thing to avoid and to rather focus your strengths, your capital, your human resource on the parts above that basic stack that differentiates you and focus on what you want to do. And so that, that to me is the advice is, is um, you, you want to pick a, a partner like AWS that will do that undifferentiated heavy lifting for you and you focus on the top of the value chain where it actually takes you to the bedside, uh, takes you to the bench. Uh, and so that's the, it's often difficult to figure out what not to do, but I would, my advice is to also think about that as well as what it is you want to do. When you, th when you sort of focus on what not to do, that helps you identify the, the parts and components for a partner you want to use to do that undifferentiated portion for you. No, that makes sense. You know, and I really like, and I think it will help, you know, the folks here that aren't ready, that are ready, and they don't know how to start, the framework you gave them of what people are doing today, which is getting efficiencies out of operational forecasting, like OR, we're going to talk about a case study in a second, using AI to make diagnoses, and then also predicting health events. These are critical areas for people to begin to start focusing on, and we'll help them with that.
With that yeah, said, I with that said, I want to move on to a different topic. We've talked about AI, um, this issue of cloud, right? A lot of folks don't understand cloud, or those that do get concerned about things like security, availability, etc. This is a poll that was done by um, the European Union for Cybersecurity around the adoption of cloud in healthcare. If you could help explain to the audience, like what is cloud and what can it, what is, what is the really advantages and disadvantages of thinking about cloud adoption? Yeah, I think, um, uh, well, I'll start with a basic premise. People think, and you mentioned security and privacy, obviously security privacy is sort of job zero at AWS and, uh, and, a, and a sort of a ground <laughs> Uh, uh, thing to share here is that of course AWS uh, never looks at customer data. This is a this is an absolute um, um, principle of ours, and that our customers hold their own encryption keys. Um, they own their data. They own their content. When they build models uh, for machine learning on AWS, they own those machine learning models. We we are um, um, we we in no shape or form open the payload and look at customer data in any way. And from perspective of the the value of the cloud is that there's sort of a few features that it brings to you, which is one is you know, in today's day and age, the, all organizations are under incredible pressure to experiment, to try things, because not everyone sort of knows the answers of how to navigate uh, and modernize and, and transform healthcare. And so there's a lot of experimentation going on. And in the traditional model, you have to sort of order equipment, drop ship it into the data center, wait till it's configured, sort of wait for the capital cycle to acquire that data, and then have it configured and spun up. And then you try to do a pilot, that's already taken six months, then you try to do a pilot, and if a pilot is successful, then you sort of have to go back and say, well, now what kind of equipment do I need to scale this? All that goes away in the cloud is that you can spin up, it's like, you know, basically you, you only pay for what you use. You spin up a, a virtual machine, if that's what you're doing. You can, in an agile manner, you spin it up, you try, to exp you try your experiment. If it doesn't work, you shut it down. It's like tap water. You only pay for the water that you turned on and used, you turn off the tap, it's finished. And, if the experiment worked, which by the way, you spin up instantly, it's within seconds, if not minutes. Um, and if it worked, you can just scale it. And if you decide that you're doing experimentation, it works and you want to scale it larger and larger, you don't have to tear everything down and then start over again with new equipment, again, drop ship with a bigger order. You, Whatever it is you spun up and experiment if it worked, you continue to scale it because you just, it's like tap water, you drip it first, and if you, it's, you like the thing you're drinking, you just turn up the water faster, the water flows faster. Our global infrastructure means you can scale it, you can uh, build it out and don't have to, um, don't have to uh, worry about having to sort of get more equipment. So this idea of experimentation, trying things, being agile, being scalable, really what it does is it boosts the ability to an organization, for an organization to do, be, to do innovation and to try things without having to sort of have the legacy um, weight of equipment purchase deployment configuration. That's perhaps the most uh, potent part of cloud that people often overlook. And of course, we talked about data and AI and ML. Uh, and I, and I, so I don't want to repeat all that because obviously that's a potent power of being in the cloud. But practically, if you have innovative ideas, you want to try things, cloud gives you that agility and scalability and that, that really drives your innovative agenda. No, I really like this. Um, you've really helped to make clarity around this. You know, we've talked about data, it's the new oil, everybody's going to rely on it, AI is going to help us make sense of it, give us information we need to know, give us actions to take. But cloud sounds like it really allows us to leverage all that to do innovation and to do it quickly. And I think for many health systems, you know, they're not technology companies, they're health systems, right? So they really, why are they spending all the money on tech when they can actually access it in a different way? Does that you know, make sense? You know, one other thing I'll share is that actually I, I get this question every now and then, which is people say, well, that's, you know, we, we don't have the talent um, to do that. And uh, we, we know how to sort of boot up cold iron, but this is a whole different space for us. And, and I'd say to that two things. One is, uh, practically speaking, of course, AWS has all sorts of uh, uh, universities and machine learning uh, academies and so on, as well as just cloud academies and certifications. But the opposite is true as well. We see when organizations actually move to the cloud, they they are they have an easier time recruiting talent because the the talent that that is looking for for work out there is looking to do innovative things, and these um, do, when they come to interview and they ask questions, this actually becomes a draw for drawing the talent as well. Because I, I, in in addition to sort of the cloud adoption unknown, people a lot of times do tell me that we don't have the staffing to do this. 
And my answer is often, well, you you actually, A, you can train them, or B, you're going to get the right kind of staffing when you do this, um, because that is a, a draw for a lot of talent that wants to join organizations that are being innovative and being agile. Great insights. You know, this is great. So let's get into the practical issues about some case studies and what's going on now. So what we do know is that there's is applications of AI applications in, in healthcare. You've talked about a few of them. I want to quickly just get into some case studies and you know, let's go ahead and start off with this um, AWS initiative that's been done at the Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center. So I know that you've been using AI and machine learning to really focus on this first concept about operational efficiency. Why don't you share a little bit about what you learned in doing this at Beth Israel? Yeah, I think um, the the greatest lesson, by the way, terrific organization, very innovative. I, I, I loved working working with them. Love, not love, love working with them. And and this is a this is an example where it actually it also demonstrates what I sort of think now of the three lifts of AI. Um, and so it, the first lift is something you're already doing, which you can do a lot more efficiently. So, for example, in this case and this particular slide you shared around. I'm coordinating OR schedules. I know there are folks out there that manually and using their sort of intelligence uh, between their ears, if you will, are coordinating schedules. And so this first lift is this idea that there's something you're already doing, it's inefficient, it's perhaps manual, laborious, and AI can come and do that more effectively for you. So that's sort of lift one. And that's the example you have here. But there are two other lifts that this particular example, um, I will tell you about the other things that, that Beth Israel did as well that, that demonstrated the second and third order lifts of AI ML. The second order lift might be something like this, which is in true case in the, the case of Beth Israel, which is we want to predict who's going to be a no-show to an appointment. Now that's something that you probably can't just gestalt. In other words, it's not something you're already doing. And what, what that second order lift is, that something you want to do but the technology wasn't readily available yet or was too expensive. And, and so you, it, it was on your roadmap. But you're, waiting for, you're waiting for a break for this to happen. And, and Beth Israel actually did that with AI ML. They, get, they predict no shows. So that All right. So that's the second lift. The third lift, which is the most exciting part, which is things that you didn't think of doing. And when you start AI ML, it brings for you. And that's it. That, again, the third lift here for Beth Israel is. You know, when anesthesia comes to the pre-op area and sometimes sees a patient and says, looks at the chart and says, oh, I can't put you to sleep because X, fill in the blank. And so the question became for the Israelis, could we have predicted that? And that's not something that was planned. That was not something that was sort of, it's, it's that third order lift of things you hadn't imagined. But when you start doing something, you begin to say, huh, could I have done that? And so they actually built a model they used one of AWS services called Comprehend Medical that actually reads a chart and creates a knowledge graph from the notes, built a model that predicts OR cancellations. And so now you have these three lifts. I'm, I'm doing scheduling, but I want to do it more efficiently. So lift one, I want to predict or, uh, no shows, but I don't quite know how the technology arrives. I can do it. Lift two. Then when the technology arrives, innovative ideas that come out of nowhere, I've never thought of them. But just in the, in the daily work of doing stuff, I asked the question, huh, could we do that? And that's the example of a third lift. So we see these as uh, sort of the three lifts of bringing AI ML to bear. Um, and we see it over and over again. You know, what we're doing, we do better. What we want to do, we haven't been able to do. And then what we never imagined, we're now doing. So this is interesting. You know, this first lift you describe is really the automation of routine tasks. And that's a huge advantage of machine learning as a subtype of AI, right? So um, yep. being able to coordinate schedules, getting that efficiency from automating routine tasks. And there's so many in healthcare that we were just, how many of us have filled out forms, even people, they got to refill it out. They're constantly going and clicking on different things to put things into their EMR. And the second one, the issue of no-shows, you know, being able to predict like when people are going to come and how do you maximize the use of your clinicians? Because we all are wasting time for not working at the top of our license. And then lastly, this is true AI, being able to find out the reason that challenges arise, such as when there's inefficiencies and people show up to the OR and they really shouldn't be there. So this is great. This is really showing how you can really improve efficiency. And it sounds like the partnership with Beth, Beth Israel has been really fabulous to do that. 
You know, let's move on to another case study. We've all been thinking about the role that AI can have in genomics, and we all know that sequencing has gone dramatically from what took, you know, almost a year to 24 hours, huge breakthrough a few years ago. I know that you've been working with Grail and collaborating with academia and some of the leading community centers. Tell us a little bit about some of the achievements that you achieved uh, with this whole issue. Sure, and uh, again, Grail, great, great company, and there's just basically the by way of as uh, sort of background of what actually the the problem and the opportunity that Grail, the opportunity and the problem that Grail is solving is, when you think of um, cancer and cancer cells as as they die in the body, um, cancer cells will release their DNA into the blood, and so you have um, if you have God forbid a cancer, there is floating around in in our sort of blood fragments uh, uh, of free DNA. And the question Grail asked, which is a brilliant question, which is, well, if we take a sample of blood, can we find those fragments of cancerous DNA and then sequence and use a predictive model to, to sort of predict uh, that, that there's a particular cancer that's brewing in this individual? And so it's a combination, of, of course, sequencing, which um, currently 85% of all world sequencing is done on Illumina. Illumina is built on AWS. And so um, sequencing and putting the data in the cloud um, is just for step one. And then um, from that uh, sequence, um, Grail will take um, that data from the DNA, uh, which is processed on AWS, and then combine it with, uh, remember earlier I said, we have all this electronic health data that's in silos. Grail actually then brings that electronic health data, so, that, so what we call the phenotypic data. So we have genotypic data from the blood cells uh, from the blood, excuse me, from the blood and the DNA fragments. And then you have phenotypic data from the EHR. And they use AWS machine learning to actually build a model that can predict the likelihood of a particular cancer up to 10 or 12 um, that are uh, being predicted. And so this is the, the idea of sort of precision diagnosis where with a, with a sample of blood and using the sequencing and the genomic data that's processed in the cloud combined with patients uh, medical records can literally uh, diagnose precisely um, a particular cancer. And this, this is, uh, when we talk about precision health, we talk about precision therapeutics, really in order to do early detection and to do precise therapies, this is the kind of technology and the kind of company that's going to actually enable it. And from our perspective, this is actually goes to the, uh, to the story of the undifferentiated heavy lifting. So when you, the way you have those icons actually is exactly how we do this. There's some undifferentiated lifting of the raw power of storing the genomic data, storing the HR data, creating the data lake, um, creating the machine learning models that do the prediction. That's all pure technology that's not differentiating in what Grail wanted to do, which is to predict cancer and help people um, early, with early detection and, and early intervention. So they take that undifferentiated heavy lifting from AWS and then move up the stack, if you will, to the bedside and built their terrific company on top of that, uh, built entirely in the cloud. So this is a perfect example of undifferentiated heavy lifting and them focusing on what gives value to their organization, where they focus their talent and their people. Um, and um, there are, I know, expanding to, to look at more uh, more, different, uh, more um, types of uh, gene data and cancers. So that's sort of the example and, and of, of, uh, of both uh, precision diagnosis for early detection, as well as a company that said, there's stuff we shouldn't be doing we're just going to use the cloud for that. And there's stuff we should be doing, like clinical files and focusing on the genomics and the, and the, and the actual care of individuals, and that's the part they're doing. You know, there's two interesting things that come up for me when you talk about this, and this is fascinating. You know, um, one is, and I've had a lot of my, my friends and colleagues that are oncologists, you know, they've said that you know, the most important thing in cancer treatment is time to diagnosis, right, and then time to treatment, those two things. It's because cells are dividing all the time. And as cells divide, comes a greater and greater challenge around survival and around um, you know, the kind of interventions that are gonna be done, whether it's chemo or um, surgery. Um, this sounds like it really helps to compress that amount of time, at least for those cancers that you've been able to do this for, and also get very precise. Um, have you been able to detect or at least project in your mind the kind of outcomes this might achieve in cancer? Because that's really the the dream. Uh, absolutely. I mean, th this goes to uh, the, the same example I gave with congestive heart failure and predicting it fi uh, 15 months in advance. Um, 
when when as a, as a nation we talk about reducing the cost of care, the early detection and uh, is is perhaps one of the most potent methods in which we can impact um, the reduction in cost of care and of course improving life of individuals, patients, and and the longevity and 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 so on. So that is uh, moving the diagnosis up earlier and earlier with the use of what essentially I would look at as three types of data. You have genomic data, you have phenotypic data, which is sort of the electronic health record data, and the one data we haven't talked about, which is sort of our digital biomarkers, the way you walk, the way you talk. Um, these are all digital biomarkers with increasing sensor data that's being uh, that's in our lives, like the, the phone you have in your pocket, that's sensor data. We are, um, we are at a point where we can build models to predict earlier and more accurately. And that is um, the heart of sort of the change of the cost quality curve is, is this prediction model, pre these prediction models. So I, I think this is going to have a profound impact on precision health and our ability to improve quality and improve safety and reduce cost. No, and actually makes... improve, improve the health journey for the individual. No, that makes a lot of sense. And, you know, it, a lot of this, particularly the combination of genomic data with phenotypic data that you get in the EHR, you know, is really going to help to advance the field dramatically. And the biggest barriers I mentioned before has been, you know, the speed at which we can actually sequence. And I understand that's getting quicker and quicker. You've had some experience at Children's Hospital with speed and rapidity of doing sequence. This is a fascinating story. I think the audience would love to hear about this. Tell us. Yeah, the, the um, you know, when you think of the first whole genome sequence took what, like 12 years and a billion dollars and and uh, naturally our ability to do the example we just gave with Grail would not work if that's how long it took for us to um, sequence whole genomes. And and the thing about, if we go back to that tap, water tap story where I said the, the, the thing about cloud is agility and scalability, the data, the volume of data in genomics is so large that in order to do the post-processing, so what's called the secondary analysis, you need a lot of storage A and you need a lot of computer horsepower B. And sometimes you might fire up a thousand cores in this example, or sometimes up to 20,000 cores, meaning a CPU um, units to do a work. And nobody, no organization that wants to do genomics, whether research, whether pharma, whether health systems, are going to want to have 20,000 computers sitting on standby in their data center in the event that in the pediatric ICU, they want to do whole genome sequencing on a patient that was recently born and has some um, has some issues, which is a common sort of story. So this challenge is you need a lot of storage and compute, but only intermittently. And that's where the cloud, that's that agility, scalability really comes into play because you, you storage, it, you have essentially infinite storage and infinite compute. So this example where um, it, there was a for sequencing in the ICU that, that they use a couple of this particular example you have was the, the goal of seeing exactly how much could you push that agility and that idea of using compute from AWS on demand. And so the, the goal and task here was to actually uh, see if they could, how, how fast could they go? Um, to demonstrate that they uh, um, did a thousand uh, whole genome sequences and spiked, um, I think in the spike point, reached 21,000 cores um, and uh, whole sequenced those 1,000 genomes in two hours and 25 minutes as sort of a demonstration of the, the, the value of having um, your genomic environment on a cloud so that you spike up as you need and take it down as you need. In order to do, as you know, sort of the pediatric ICUs, and the neonatal ICUs, I should say, when, when kids are born and might have immediate and imminent uh, risk to their death, there's often some sort of a genetic, genetic anomaly. And, and this idea of diagnosing uh, what is the underlying genetic anomaly so that the appropriate therapy can be put in place, time is of the incredible essence. And so this is, as, as the organizations like the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia look to bringing that level of precision medicine to their patients, economically, they don't want to have 50,000 computers sitting somewhere on standby. And this is where the cloud uh, plays an incredible role in our partnership with uh, our sort of collaboration we do with the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia and the use of AWS allows them to do this sort of thing. Um, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. You know, as I think about this, you know, you and I and, and many clinicians, you know, really truly understand that many of the things we 
things that we call diseases, particularly the ones that are of importance in our healthcare costs, like the chronic diseases, congestive heart failure, hypertension, myocardial infarction. Like for many of these, they're not true diseases, right? They're clusters of symptoms and labs that go together. And I think once we actually get this sort of you know, goal of being able to sequence quickly, be able to learn how to combine genomic and phenotypic data, I think we're gonna learn a lot more what true diseases we have and what true interventions we might. Do you think? I, I think actually, absolutely. This is um, a, a area of, you know, you see all the different, many different, I think right now there's 60 or 65 different nations in the world that are atten attempting some sort of whole population sequencing because, it's about understanding what's normal. It's understanding what's, of course, a disease state. And as the depth of that data increases globally and certainly nationally, our ability to predict diseases becomes not just based on your symptoms. If you think of it, we only have a certain number of ways of expressing our conditions. You know, our symptoms are, are uh, you know, you, you might have a headache. It could be something from a cold to, God forbid, an aneurysm. The, the, di the diversity of ways in which we express underlying disease, unfortunately, is limited. Um, yet, when you go to the gene level, you have op you open up a whole new category of opportunities for understanding what is the underlying uh, condition that uh, the, the underlying premise of a disease. And so, yes, this is going to be uh, significant. And, I, and I, again, I would add that I think digital exhaust, as I as I call it, sort of the, what what comes out of our sensors, because we do have sensors, whether it's in your wrist, in your pocket, in your shoes, um, eventually in your belt and clothing. I think those will play a role as well. I think all three categories will contribute to the variety. The with the one V I mentioned earlier. The variety and certainly genomics contributes to variety and of course it's ground truth so it contributes to veracity so this is genomics meets all three v requirements you know that makes a lot of sense you know um at innovator we provide what's called a data activation platform that we uh, frequently are deploying in partnership with aws for our clients and i want to you know have you talk a little bit about two things here you've talked about efficiency being able to automate things we've talked about you know, being able to give information to people that they otherwise would not have. Um, and then we've also talked a little bit about the issue of privacy and security when it comes to the cloud. So let's break this down for a second. Um, you've talked a lot about automating routine processes, you know, the three lifts that you've been able to show in a health system. How about this engaging providers in the point of care? You know, we moving in the healthcare system to value-based care, strong emphasis on primary care is a role there. You know, what kind of value do you see that we can move to with giving 360 full information from the health system, from the cloud, to people at the point of care while they're making decisions for patients? Well, I, yeah, the, the provider uh, experience then is, is a great story to, to sort of focus on as well. You know, just by way of background, I know you know that AWS obviously committed to the standards-based interoperability. We signed on with FHIR back in 2018 and sort of re-upped our commitment in 2019 um, in, in Washington at the Blue Button 2 Developer Conference. So, and, and we have, um, uh, so not only have we committed at an organizational level, but we have some terrific partners like Change Healthcare, Clacta City, Cerner, Black Pair Software, Redox, Orion, these are all organizations that have built incredible intraoperability platforms directly on top of AWS to bring information from disparate points of service to the single point of care where the patient is so that effective positive action can be taken by a clinician. So we consider this incredibly important and have uh, not only committed ourselves, but also uh, worked with our uh, partner network to make sure that we deliver that. Um, and, and, you know, I think that other part of the story that we are, we, we, we see incredible opportunity is it's not just data interoperability, but semantic interoperability. In other words, what is the meaning behind the data? I can move a payload, a, 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 just for lack of, uh, just as simple, I call it PDF note. I can use a, you know, move a PDF note from point A to point B, but to your comment on the clinician experience, um, Delivering a PDF note may not be the best way to delight a clinician because they have to read all these PDF notes and sort of extract information from it um, and, and or knowledge from it. And so we also are working on ways to really, for example, with Comprehend Medical, where you can read a note and extract a knowledge graph. So part of the story around interoperability to us is both data interoperability and semantic interoperability that where we apply AI-based technologies to deliver not just the initial payload, but to de de deliver, excuse me, an understanding of that payload that can be then used in care by, for example, extracting a blood value and then and then charting it versus having a physician read 15 PDFs 
and figure out what's the trend of the sugar, um, but actually being able to extract the knowledge from that, get discrete data, the medication, the rote, the dose, um, and so on, and actually give semantic interoperability as well as data interoperability. That's great. You know, this has been a fabulous discussion. I'd like to move on to something else of interest, particularly as we talk about data and the role of you know, chronic diseases. There's been a strong interest as we talk about social determinants of health, the social, environmental, and economic drivers of health outcomes in populations, in patients. And, you know, it's interesting, we've learned from a lot of studies that on the bottom of this slide, providing clinical care, right, things we do every day with medical intervention, actually may be a minority contributor from a population perspective. And then we have to go upstream, or as my friend David Nash from the School of Population Health at Jefferson says, we have to stop mopping up the floor and go upstream and turn off the faucet. Can you say a little bit about how cloud and AI will really help us think about these social, environmental, and economic drivers and how we might kind of bring them into the health system, how we might make that information accessible and useful in health? Yeah, I think what you're describing is essentially what we're seeing is an increasing diversity in the access points to care because uh, uh, you know individuals want sort of their care their way, my care my way, and, and care is no longer really essentially a dyad of either in the clinic or in the hospital. And that as, as patients uh, and, and individuals move through their sort of health journey, that there's a splaying happening where you have some care that's through conversational agents, uh, uh, some, some through chat, some through video visits, some through uh, community, uh, community centers. Uh, and so this, as we, and, and this was broad, broadening and, and splaying this occurring, which is appropriate because the dyad is 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 very limiting, and um, and being able to get care at different points of care, different points of um, of a of an ecosystem is critical and important. And of course, the challenge goes back to your first slide: is that now that we begin to move to a model where my care my way, that contributes to that potential increasing in silo effect that's happening. And so, all the conversations we just had around interoperability and data liquidity and connecting become much more important as you begin to actually embrace this idea that um, that data can occur in many points of, of, of a person's journey. Imagine if your data for your banking on your mobile device actually was siloed from the web interface, was siloed from the bank itself, and was siloed from the ATM. And, and that would completely, I mean, that would break apart banking. And yet in healthcare, as we are broadening the places where we are um, receiving care or engaging uh, things that contribute to our health and wellness, we're actually seeing an increasing silo effect. Uh, video visits, is the data in video visits inside the EHR? When I go to see my clinician follow-up afterwards, do they know what video visit I had or if I have a conversational chat? So this is a good direction of sort of moving upstream and, and broadening the horizon of where we get care and if we don't juxtapose that to stitching together the underlying fabric through some of the discussions we had earlier around data liquidity and interoperability, we may find ourselves in, in a more challenging position than when we were when we had a dyad of clinic and hospital. No, that makes we, sense. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And you know, this presents a lot of challenges. Like, how do we start thinking about engaging care in the rest of the community, finding different access points? These are great points that you brought up. Let's ask our audience, you know, what strides that they've made in this area, right? So have they begun to effectively leverage community resources? Have you been able to identify other access points in the community to deliver care or other partnerships to work with? So let's go ahead and do this as a poll. Please use your click bar to enter in your answer. Are you efficiency lever efficiently leveraging community resources today or are you just able to identify community areas where you can start to think about developing these partnerships? Are you not able to figure this out? Are you not able to like navigate? Like, how do I think about the four walls of the hospital and how do I move outside of there? Uh, and, you know, do you not even think you need to do that? Is the hospital the place to deliver everything? So while we're waiting for this, this answer is to see where people are at with that, I have a couple of questions. You know, at, at Innovacer, we've used machine learning in our data science groups where we've 
leverage the cloud and leverage AWS to start looking at some interesting questions, we've developed a social risk score, a social vulnerability risk score, in addition to a clinical risk score. And, you know, there's been a lot of interesting articles recently in the press, particularly with the science article that came out about a month ago, around machine learning to develop these algorithms for risk and the kind of bias they may have. Have you tracked this area? Have you thought about this? Is this an area of interest to people? You know, I, I think there's been some really thoughtful discussions uh, that we've uh, seen in, in some of our customers around the use of um, AI ML. And I, I'll give an example of uh, uh, which which I um, heard, uh, and um, and this is not to do with any of the any of the customers or any of the um, um, organizations that we talked about today. Um, let's go back to that concept of predicting no-shows to a clinic and so when when you when you are able to predict a no-show to a clinic you might ask the question okay so what do we do about it and and one of the natural answers might be well so let's double book if there's a 90 percent chance someone's not going to show let's go ahead and um and book a second appointment sort of like the airline approach of predicting a no-show and then booking overbooking a flight and um uh, you can imagine, ask yourself the question, well, who are likely to no show? And uh, you could say that if it wasn't, isn't it much to imagine that it might be someone who's um, perhaps has two jobs, doesn't have a car, might be a single parent, disenfranchised, marginal society. And so the point is that when they do show, now you have two appointments on that slot and they actually get less time, whereas they actually might need more time with the physician or the nurse or the clinician. So that question of what do you do with that data? Do you actually double book or do you say, you know what, we need to set in motion a set of uh, mechanisms and processes that for those that we predict a no-show, let's actually reach out, see if they need an Uber or Lyft, they'll see if they need childcare, maybe we have a, maybe our organization sets up a method to assist and find out what the underlying cause is and to actually help alleviate that. So you can take that prediction of no-show one of two ways which is double book, or try to reach out and find out how can we help that person show. And that's, we're seeing great thoughtful discussion in our, uh, in, the, in the, both actually at the industry level, but also in, in customers around understanding how do we actually apply and how do we understand what, what this prediction tells us and how, what does that say about us is what we do about it. So yes, the, we're seeing a lot of thoughtful dialogue and a lot of organizations. In fact, I was at a recent meeting where um, there was a chief AI ethics um, person in the room, and I was delighted that she was there. It was just delight. It was a delight. So we are seeing a lot of thoughtful reflection on this is technology, but how do we implement it? How do we avoid un unintended consequences that um, might be viewed, um, of course, as being inappropriate? No, that's fascinating. You know, the the article I referred to that came out in Science uh, about two weeks ago really showed bias based on the training data that you were using to develop the algorithm. Uh, some people, some groups may just naturally not have access to transportation or may have not lacking trust in the healthcare system. So if you use a database that doesn't truly reflectively weight that, it may end up with bias. But I think your point, you know, some people with no-show rates, you can do all you can about the efficiency, but how do you help patients? How do you then, like for instance, here at Innovacer, we're learning how to give clinicians the access to, for certain patients, deploy Lyft. Lift Health to be able to bring people into the appointment or provide virtual visits at home or provide transportation or, or um, a partnership with a home health agency. And how do you deploy those efficiency in addition to the efficiencies you get by dealing with no-shows and appointment scheduling in, in the health system? So this is very fascinating. Let's look at our audience and see what they're doing in terms of engaging these additional research, resources outside of the four walls of the hospital. So this is interesting. So some people are just able to identify groups and they're starting to make strides. Other people are using them, starting to address these barriers, social, environmental, and economic barriers. This is fascinating. Well, cool, let's move on. Um, you know, we've talked a lot about computers and AI and machine learning, and we hear a lot of physicians particularly that have said, you probably read the article, Death by a Thousand Clicks, that the EHRs that we deployed have been more of an impediment to the relationship, the human aspects of healthcare. With all these strides being made in AI and machine learning, automation, the use of computers, can 
do you see a light where AI can actually bring back the human focus of healthcare? I think, um, you know, I think of the William Mosler quote of, of to cure sometimes, to relieve often, and to comfort always. And, and nowadays, unfortunately, it's become sort of like to face the patient sometimes, to click often, and, and to type always. Um, that's really essentially been the, the, the challenge in, uh, of, of the clinician experience today. And I think um, there's no question that there are a number of technologies, and, and for example, uh, voice is a great example. You know, the, the ultimate... Um, uh, go, in it, when we, you, you probably know the recent uh, collaboration we announced with Cerner, and one of the one of the goals of the True North of that is, of course, to, and I would say this is probably for for any EHR companies to remove um, the keyboard and mouse from the exam room. And and voice technology and AI based voice technology is one of the methods in which you can protect the clinician experience and let them return to that sort of the crucible of the importance of the the clinician uh, patient interaction. So we we certainly see a role in um, making technology ambient and invisible and yet able to deliver its value. So voice is one example of, of that where um, uh, the interactions between uh, both the in ambiently between the patient and physician um, can be, um, if you will, converted to things that are uh, meaningful in the chart and useful, as well as beyond um, patient directly with, uh, with, uh, for example, I know you know of Alexa Health and there's some uh, pilots and early wins with uh, using Alexa Health and uh, Alexa at home, as well as there are um, uh, technologies that uh, um, we currently have that are voice enabled and are HIP eligible that can be used for optimizing the experience of clinicians and, and uh, with, with systems. So that, that's one dimension um, of removing friction where the computer appears to have inserted itself back into the in between the clinician and the patient. I think there are other ones as well. And, and one example we talked about earlier, which um, is as you embed predictive modeling in the electronic health record and or into the clinical operating system, I think it helps the clinician make the right thing, the, the sort of the right thing, the easy thing. This reducing the cognitive burden by being that co-traveler that works with the clinician and does a large amount of computing crunching to support with clinical vision support, sort of augmented, these atomic intelligence that gets embedded into the, um, like a Cerner environment, um, and it supports the clinician. So it's not just the user interface, but the actual, so the guts of these technologies as they get atomic intelligence embedded into them will be the support the clinician needs to sort of navigate and do the right things, um, uh, help them make the right decisions, I should say. So I, I certainly think that both making the technology invisible, A, and B, when you are using the technology, for it to be your supporter, not sort of um, the um, hard stop click through that, that we are seeing over and over again, which is a hindrance. So remove the headwind, give a tailwind, make it be invisible, make that experience go back. These are all things that we see. Um, uh, we're sort of in dialogue with, with Cerner, as, as, as uh, you might know, in terms of optimizing and protecting the clinician experience. No, that makes a lot of sense. You know, um, I think there is a lot of promise that technology can lead, bring us. And I think it's a, I think as these technologies evolve and they adopt to working with people, we just need better training, right? And I think one of the things that I've learned, particularly with working with one of our advisors here at Innovators, Dr. Steve Plasco, who runs Jefferson Health System, mm -hmm. is that an academic medical center should probably focus on training physicians to do what humans do, right? Have that empathy, have that coaching and creativity. And I think have the technology do all those things you've described are now becoming capable, like automating routine tasks and teeing up the data to inform clinicians to make decisions. And, you know, I think as Dr. Plasco often says is, we just need to have humans and robots learn to work together. Or what he's often summarized is what we call augmented intelligence as AI, not artificial intelligence. Obviously, it's all about healthcare being a human side and a technology side. Doesn't that make sense? It does, absolutely. I think um, b bottom line is, is that we want to free up clinicians to pay attention to what they want, to, what they train to do, and to bring the sort of the joy of, uh, of, of, of medicine uh, back to the, to the clinician's uh, life. It, it's, it certainly seemed to have waned a bit. Gosh, you know, there's so much interest in bringing the joy of practice of medicine back. So that's great. Great. Well, we're getting close to the end, and we've got a ton of questions that have come in. 
And I just want to tee a couple of those up. So uh, first question is, how will organizations who want to engage in AI and ML initiatives, machine learning initiatives, avoid negative press or negative reactions like we just saw in the Wall Street Journal around the Nightingale project that Google and Ascension has done? People that just scared by what they read. How can people begin to make these advances using ML and AI and yet avoid these sort of negative perceptions in the industry? I think um, any AI initiative that you're embarking on, I think the idea is to really break it down into smaller components and to um, and, and to sort of crawl before you run. And in fact, uh, really starting with operational excellence, if you will, uh, is, is really a great place to start because I, I tend to see people always uh, start with um, the, the, what I would call the more challenging side, which is sort of how can we use AI ML to make a clinical diagnosis. And yet in the, on the, um, on the operational forecasting, there are a lot of opportunities. Predicting length of stay on admission, predicting readmission rates, predicting admission to ICU based on where you are on the floor. These are all small, uh, you know, if you will, more contained initiatives that are operationally focused. And um, and certainly, uh, you know, th those are where I would, I would, if I were starting with uh, with an organization, I would start with operational forecasting. It's a great place to start. It's uh, it's very typically there's a very operational question that wants to be answered. It's not open ended. Can you um, predict X? Can you predict Y? I think that's where I would begin if I were um, wanting to start with with this. Um, and that's what. But, but I think people can get a lot of experience under their belt without imagining wholesale, um, you know, how do we take all our patient data, put it over here and do something with it. Um, I think you, you want to be measured, thoughtful, and learn. Um, these, are, these are new technologies, but they're a tool to an actual operational or clinical end. So that's where I would, what the advice I would give. No, that makes sense. I think we have time for one more question. This is a great question. You know, even when you're looking at operational efficiencies, as you've described, or if you're looking at sort of this, you know, revealing genomic information and then pairing it with stuff in the EHR, or combining information that you get from other sources, such as you're getting from search bars or your smartphone or whatever, um, how does healthcare industry address what's often perceived as the black box nature of what's going on inside, right, within the AI algorithms? How can we really get the concept of black box and get more transparency, or at least where people trust what they're learning and what they're saying. Yeah, that's going to take an hour to discuss. <laughs> <laughs> I told you, it was a great question. We've gotten some great minutes to do that one. It's a chip shot, right? Okay, let's just end with this easy one. Uh, <laughs> well done. Um, this is a challenge yeah. for you. Where this goes to that uh, question, to that, you know, when I think of um, the idea, of course, is that some of the deep learning models, like neural networks, the, the part of the question is, look, when you build a neural network, you know the recommendation and the prediction is done, but you really don't know why. And, and obviously, we don't have time to get into the sort of the, the science and physics of, of, of why uh, of this particular statement. But, the, the, you know, one of the things I would encourage people to think is that when you think of how, how do we look at a particular prediction as a mathematical test that is actually supporting a clinical decision making done by a human. Um, when you think of a blood test, the data goes to a physician or a nurse. When you think of a MRI or a cascade, whatever it is, these 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 data sets, the excuse me, these um, interpretations are actually going to a clinician who's then combining that and making a decision based on their abilities, this sort of augmented clinical decision support. And if you take that lens where you're doing a prediction, you're, it's a probability, it's a pretest probability that you're actually then surfacing to a clinician who based on that prediction from that deep learning model, for example, and the lab test and the, you know, the imaging and the what have you, he or she is making a clinical decision. There is, the lens becomes different when you think of it that way. And I think those are areas where we need to build some trust and some, um, understanding and engage and embracing of this technology through using augmented clinical decision support where it is an input to a, to a clinician i think that is what's going to take time for for um or, or it's going to be the method through which we begin to build trust um as opposed to uh, perhaps saying that i this this machine is making this diagnosis do i believe it i, I would say that let's look at augmentation of decision making by supporting a clinical clinician so that's the angle I would take is that second part where it's not operational forecasting, but it's augmented clinical support. Again, the human is making the decision. This is a that's prediction. Right. 
that supports the human's decision-making process. Yeah, makes a lot of sense. And you know, back to you know what we learned from Jack Welch 30 years ago, culture eats strategy every day. It's mm-hmm. all an issue of getting trust in place. So that's teed up for the next hour conversation we'll have in our next webinar, because <laughs> that is a complex problem. I want to thank you very much, Dr. Pertpovi. I want to thank our audience for participating. It's been a great webinar. Learned a lot about what AWS is doing, and certainly we'll follow up with people and, and tee them into the partnership around AWS and Innovacer. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. It was terrific. I really appreciate this. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you, everybody. That ends our webinar.